A girl just walked into her school. She found her brother being shoved into a locker by bullies. The moment they touched her brother, it was as if her third eye had opened. She saw the faces of the bullies with perfect clarity and showed up at the pool with the plastic bags in her hands. Then she threw the plastic bags into the pool and the piranhas would then begin their vicious attack. The bullies scrambled to escape. In the end, the hard bully was the last one left. Unfortunately, the piranhas took his children from him before he had the chance to have them. The girl just smiled with glee at the scene. Because of the assault, the girl was expelled from the school. So her parents used their connections and decided to send her to their alma mater, Navamore Academy. But this is no ordinary school. The kids here aren't. There are vampires who fear the sun, werewolves who howl at the first glimpse of the full moon, sirens who think they dominate the school, and more. But the girl listen, she is the daughter of the famous Adams. Wednesday, she loves darkness. Blood and slaughter excite her. The more she makes people think she's weird, the happier she is. But who would have thought? Wednesday the loner was finally about to have her first ever roommate. The moment she pushed the door open, the vibrant colors hurt her eyes. The Adams, a cute and enthusiastic girl, appeared in front of them equals Wednesday's new roommate, a little werewolf girl, Kudazan, led by her new roommate. Wednesday was given a tour of the strange school. Soon, she and her family will have to part ways, although Wednesday was entirely against her parents. For now, she had to stay, at least until she could find a chance to escape. When her parents were about to leave, her mother gave her a necklace that could conjure spirits and a crystal ball to communicate with her family. Her father also gave her his pet, a severed hand named Thing. He quietly led it out of the car to secretly spy on Wednesday. Meanwhile, in the forest not far away, the police found a corpse in a horrific state, with limbs splayed at unnatural angles. The death was similar to two other recent murders. The police speculated that the killer might be a student at Nevermore Academy. After all, there are all sorts of eccentrics and oddities there. Nevermore Academy had an eerie aura in the depths of the night. Inside the room, Wednesday had torn down the colorful stained glass stickers on the window. The space was instantly divided into two completely separate worlds. One side was like a Jackson Pollock painting and the other was like an old black and white photo. Wednesday and the little werewolf had a fight over their habits and routine. The fight was endless, without any resolution in sight. It was only when the teacher who managed the residence appeared that the war finally stopped. The teacher gave Wednesday her favorite Dahlia and then left. Who would think that just a few days after starting at the school, Wednesday was in danger. One day, as she was walking out of the school building in the pouring rain, she suddenly heard a strange sound from above. A stone statue fell straight towards her from the eaves above. At that critical moment, a boy appeared in time, sheltering Wednesday under his body. But just after their brush with disaster, Wednesday fainted. When she woke up again, she was already in the infirmary, faced with the good Samaritan who saved her life. But Wednesday did not say thank you. Instead, she blamed him for saving her life, because she could have died in an interesting way. When the boy heard this, he thought that Wednesday was still the same as when she was a child. It turns out that the boy, Farp, is Wednesday's old acquaintance. She had saved him once when he was 10 years old. Now they are even. Night again, Wednesday went back to her dorm room to work on her novel, just as she did every day. But suddenly, there was a movement from under her covers. The girl heard a strange noise from her bed, so she ripped off the blanket where she found a severed hand looking for a place to hide. She grabbed it, pinned it on the table. It turned out that the severed hand was her father's pet who had been sent to watch her and make sure she didn't sneak out of her new school. Unexpectedly, its mission was discovered. Under the girl's repeated threats, the severed hand decided to submit to her and help her when she tried to escape. Soon, the opportunity came. One day, Wednesday was personally transported by the principal to the town for counseling, but her inner mind is not for the faint of heart. The therapist tried to correct her preference for fighting fire with fire, but Wednesday is a girl who loves dark things. She recalled an editor from a while ago because he rejected Wednesday's horror novel. He got his hand caught in a mousetrap that she sent him. The conversation slowly petered off. At that moment, Wednesday asked to go to the bathroom, just as she was closing the door. Fiend, the severed hand leapt out and handed Wednesday a pair of nail clippers. She gently turned the lock cylinders and the window opened instantly. After checking out the situation below, like a Jackie Chan disciple, she successfully escaped by sliding down the drain pipe, trying to keep the principal from discovering her. Wednesday panicked, accidentally knocking over an old man on the road. Instantly, her eyes opened wide again. She saw that the old man in front of her was about to have a car accident. Unlike last time, this time, she seemed to have foreseen the future. Seeing the old man, Wednesday left quickly. She went to a cafe. She wanted for espressos to go, but the waiter had a huge headache because the machine was not working. Seeing this, 
When Zay looked at the manual, written in Italian, grabbed a screwdriver, and tinkered with it, in no time, she fixed the machine. He gave her a admirative look, he introduced himself as Taylor. After introducing herself, Wednesday was about to go to the nearby train station. That's when Taylor stopped her. He said he could drive her there when he finished his work as thanks for her help. While Wednesday was waiting, a group of Christian students walked in, seeing that Wednesday was a freak from Nevermore Academy. Their school, three of them verbally attacked her, but Wednesday wasn't faced with provocation. She used her fists and her feet. In a matter of seconds, she took down the three boys who were taller than her. The noise of the fight drew the attention of the town sheriff. The principal also rushed over. During the conversation, the sheriff found out that Wednesday was from the Adams. His tone became unfriendly. When Wednesday, his face turned cold and hateful, and he told Wednesday that her father was a murderer. Having failed to escape, Wednesday had to follow the principal back to school. On the way, they saw a serious car accident. The person involved in the accident was the old man that Wednesday met earlier that day. It seems that the vision in her eyes was real. Thinking of this, she touched the summoning necklace on her chest. Back at the school, Wednesday played that cello on the roof of the building. The melody was thrilling and mesmerizing. It was like a suspenseful drama. Meanwhile, a mysterious male student crept into the old library. He unleashed his special psychic powers, pulling out one of the books and ripping out an illustrated page. In the town, Tyler was also looking through a case file because his father was a cop. He quickly found Wednesday's father's file. At the same time, the sheriff was worried about the three recent murders. Between these cases, what is the connection? This eight-year-old girl was unusual. While other people walk their dogs, she walks a poisonous scorpion. Such strange behavior was met with disdain from her peers. The boys pinned her against a wall so she couldn't. When the scorpion ran into the road, they crushed it under their bikes. Her best friend died in front of her. The girl was in pain. She built a tombstone for her friend. Weeping with sadness, that was the day that the girl vowed that she would never cry again in her life. Because tears come, that little little girl was Wednesday. As the nursery rhyme says, a child born on Wednesday is full of sorrow. But Wednesday's sorrow had been buried six feet under at the age of eight. Hearing this, her werewolf roommate, Enid, finally understood why she was always stone-dazed. Once again, Wednesday's desire to escape came back. So she borrowed Enid and sent the severed hand Thane to find Tyler. The moment he saw Thane, Taylor's soul almost left his body. After a fight, Tyler was defeated, so he saw the writing on the little thing's hand. Wednesday's contact information. When the video call connected, Wednesday got right to the point. She wanted Tyler to help her leave the academy in his car. He said yes, and said that when she had the chance, he also wanted to escape with her. A few days later, at the fair, everyone at the academy was having a good time. But for Wednesday, it was a perfect opportunity to escape. But looking at the principal, who was staring at her from a distance, she had to find a way to distract her so she could disappear. So with her dark skill, Wednesday won a giant panda doll and instructed the clerk to give it to the principal. In the meantime, she managed to meet with Tyler. Little did she know, Tyler was the sheriff's son. He not only found Wednesday's father's file, he even stole it and gave it to her. Faced with a sudden gesture of affection, Wednesday was a bit overwhelmed, just as they were about to drive to the train station. The three Christians who were taught a lesson by Wednesday appeared. Afraid they couldn't, they encouraged each other to grab their weapons. Taylor grabbed Wednesday and ran. They made their way through the crowd. But in the process, Wednesday accidentally bumped into her classmate, Rowan, and saw that the other was about to die, since they had met before in the infirmary. Wednesday went after him, trying to warn him of the danger he was in. But then, Rowan smiled a little. Then he used his psychic powers, pinning Wednesday to the trunk of the tree. It turns out that the boy who was looking for books in the library was Rowan. The book was written by his mother, a prophet, many years ago. And she told Rowan, if the girl in the painting appeared, Nevermore Academy and all the people inside would be destroyed. So he had to kill the girl. Rowan thought that Wednesday was the girl in the painting, so he pushed down the stone statue before. When Wednesday heard that, she thought it was ridiculous. He wanted to kill her based on a picture, but he kept choking her harder and harder. At that moment, Rowan was suddenly lifted up by a huge monster and slammed to the ground. The monster kept attacking him, slicing him open, but the moment it saw Wednesday, the monster ran away. Rowan was really dead. Just as Wednesday, looking at the strange illustration and dad's file, Wednesday thought life was finally starting to get interesting. A girl saw her classmate killed by monster, her breath catching in her throat. But the next morning, when she was reporting the crime to the police, she saw her classmate return to school in one piece. How did this happen? Last night, Wednesday was almost strangled to death by her classmate Rowan. But as she was faced with her possible death, 
a huge monster appeared and saved Wednesday by ripping open Rowan's stomach. Seeing this, Wednesday immediately called the police, but the police searched the forest all night and found no sign of the alleged bite or the monster. So that's it, the sheriff found Wednesday and told her the results, although no clues were found. The sheriff thought that the recent cases were related to the students of the academy. The principal was furious, she thought the sheriff was slandering the school, and at the same time, Wednesday insisted that she was certain that saw the monster attack Rowan. It was a monster, not a bear. During the argument, a policewoman brought a shocking news. Suddenly, Rowan appeared in front of everyone, not a scratch on him. Then what was it that Wednesday had seen the night before? She was in a state of shock. Even her schoolmates thought she was delusional. So, the principal arranged for her to go to counseling. After a lot of back and forth communication, Wednesday finally attended a full therapy session, leaving her feeling quite desolate. After leaving the clinic, she ran into Tyler. She didn't think Tyler would believe her about seeing the monster either, but he didn't even think about it. He said he believed her. It was the first time Wednesday had ever had this kind of experience. She found it unbelievable. Then, she returned to campus. Her werewolf roommate, Enid, was preparing for the college's annual rowing competition. She vowed to win first place this year. When Wednesday found her, she wanted to ask for information about Rowan. Enid said, Wednesday's childhood friend, Forp, was Rowan's roommate. Maybe they could get answers from him. Alas, they got no information. Wednesday, back in her room writing, was very irritable. She had writers. All she could think about was Rowan. And that's when she suddenly found the illustration that Rowan had torn out of the book. There was a strange watermark on it. In order to find clues, Wednesday went to the principal's office. She asked why she couldn't find Rowan anywhere. But the principal just said that Rowan had been expelled and he would be leaving by train this afternoon. When confronted with Wednesday's description of what happened in the forest, the principal suspected that she, like her mother, she had the ability to see visions. So she reminded her that visions are dangerous and not always real, and told Wednesday that she had until the end of the day. By the end of the day, she had to choose an extracurricular activity. After all, students need to be well-rounded. Before finding the right club, Wednesday told Thane, the severed hand, to keep an eye on Rowan, it would report back to her if there was anything of note. Then she went to an audition for the choir led by a siren, Bianca. Bianca teased her, asking her to choose her own vocal range. But when Wednesday opened her mouth, although there was no sound, the glasses of the chubby boy playing the piano shattered. Even the principal's decorations upstairs were not spared. Piazza looked puzzled and asked what the sound was. A note only dogs can hear. As expected of Wednesday, even when she insults people, she does it subtly. Then she went to Thorpe. Thorpe saw his favorite person coming so it couldn't help but show off. He demonstrated his excellent archery skills, hitting the target second most outer circle. But that wasn't what Wednesday was after. She asked Thorpe how Rowan was doing, finding out that Rowan had been losing it for weeks and would be leaving school this afternoon. Thorpe also told Wednesday to stay away from Tyler because he didn't think he was a good person. After hearing this, Wednesday threw an apple into the air and shot it with the arrow, all in one fluid motion, and the arrow pierced the apple and firmly sunk into the bullseye. This round was no more than a full showing off to an expert. Soon after, Wednesday intercepted Rowan in front of the school, but he refused to reveal any information. So Thing left with a difficult task. This strange right hand was following a male student. Unexpectedly, he went straight into the toilet, but soon after, he transformed into a middle-aged man with white hair. The right hand chased after him, only to find it had been trapped. If, when he rushed out to look again, the middle-aged man had already gone into an underground passage. With a shake, he transformed into an elegant woman who looks exactly like the principal. The target was nowhere to be seen. Thing rushed back to the school to report to its master. Wednesday, but she scolded it. The trail had gone cold. Wednesday decided to go to the scene themselves to collect evidence. But the principal was watching her too closely. So she asked her roommate, Enid, to join the club in her stead so she could solve the case by herself. But her roommate, who had always been a good talker, today said she wouldn't do it because she was busy preparing for the rowing competition. Wednesday thought of Thing again, but her werewolf roommate told her, Thing is mad at her right now, because when they were doing their nails last night, Thing was complaining, feeling that it hadn't been respected. So Pinnit wants Wednesday to apologize to it, before she, after a moment, Wednesday entered the room, she saw Thing reading a magazine on her bed, then she asked it to work with her. Unfortunately, Wednesday's stiff apology did not strike Thing as sincere, so it didn't move at all. Seeing this attitude, Wednesday offer did everything she could to satisfy Thing, but the Thing just beckoned her to sit next to her. It was angry because she wasn't treated like family by Wednesday. 
and it was obvious that Wednesday was hiding something from it. Hearing this, Wednesday took out the mysterious illustration. Who was the girl in it that resembled herself? She wanted to find out the truth. After getting the thing, Ina took Wednesday's place at the club. As promised, everything was ready. So Wednesday went alone to the forest where the accident happened last time. While trying to search for evidence, she heard a dog barking in the distance. Suddenly, someone covered her mouth and pulled her backwards. It was Tyler! And the sound of barking dogs was the sheriff with the hounds searching the woods. After the sheriff left, Tyler then to explain in a panic that he just did it to cover up Wednesday because he always had coffee grounds from the coffee shop on him. Unlike Wednesday, Tyler was to see what his father was up to. As soon as the words were out of his mouth, Wednesday noticed a pair of glasses not far away. They belonged to her classmate, Rowan. It could be evidence that he was killed. The moment Wednesday's hand touched the glasses, a lot of images flashed through her mind. She saw Rowan arguing with Thor. He couldn't control his powers, and she saw him go to a mysterious place, tearing out a page from a book, and on the book with the words to find out what she saw. Wednesday went to the library. She wanted to find the purple book in the vision. Unfortunately, there was no such book in the library, so she showed the image she found earlier to the teacher and found out that it was the symbol of a club called the Nightshade Society. So, Wednesday snuck into Rowan's dormitory, hoping to find clues, but Thorpe was there. She had to hide under the bed so she wouldn't, but she overheard her rival Bianca talking about how she wanted to humiliate the Black Cast team from her dorm in the rowing competition. So, Wednesday, who was very competitive, decided to join the team to beat Bianca. This is probably the rowing race with the most cheating ever. Once the gun goes off, the race began. The purple team triggered a trap at Big X lies towards the black team next to them. If not for their reflexes, their pitiful lives might have ended. The yellow team was not weak either. They got help from the outside. People who jumped into the water and turned into sirens. In an instant, they pushed the purple team's boat to the buoy and bashed it apart. Eliminating them, the sirens also tried to attack the black team. Immediately noticed by Wednesday, she ordered them to flip a switch. Instantly, Ness caught the sirens and they couldn't move. Soon, three teams made it to shore one after another. Wednesday told her teammates to stay where they were to protect the boat as she went to pull down the flag, seeing the red team in the lead. Enid asked them to get the rest of their teammates. They flicked a rock at them, then he flipped them the bird. Successfully getting their notice, the boat emptied, and Enid clawed a hole in it. At the same time, Wednesday had reached the flag, but the moment she pulled down the flag, the powerful force of a vision made her faint to the ground. When she woke up, Wednesday found herself in a different place. It was eerie and strange. Turning around, she saw a girl who looked exactly like herself. Then, Wednesday woke up from the vision. For the sake of the competition, she decided to come back later to find out what happened. By now, the red and yellow teams were on their way back. Wednesday had arrived late, but the more the leading red team rode, the worse their situation got. Their boat was leaking badly. They were sinking. The black team quickly overtook them. At that moment, Wednesday triggered another mechanism, and many spearheads appeared next to the boat. They were just about to attack the yellow team, but the trap sirens had already broken free. They swung towards the black team and did the same thing again, preparing to smash the hull of the black team. At that moment, Thing saw that the situation was going south, so it jumped into the river and quickly dove down, knocking out the shameful outside assistance with a punch. The black team was out of danger. They head for the yellow team and successfully smashed the opponent's boat. Now the yellow team was also eliminated. The black team won a huge victory. Wednesday's dormitory, Ophelia Hall, after decades, finally won the trophy back. According to the principal, the last time Ophelia Hall won an award was when Wednesday's mother was studying there. Wednesday was very uncomfortable with such a lively scene, so she went to a corner by herself. When she looked up, she found the Nightshade Society she had been looking for was hiding here, but Enid suddenly showed up and interrupted her. Wednesday would have to find another time. In the evening, she was writing as usual, but when she saw the illustration on her desk, Wednesday decided to take action. So, she went to the place where she had been in the morning by solving the crossword puzzle in the book in the statue's hand. Wednesday managed to crack the code. After snapping her fingers twice, the statue quickly slid backwards, revealing a mysterious room. Walking into the tunnels on Wednesday, I found an old book collection here. Even pictures of her parents when they were young were hanging here. She recognized that this was where Rowan had torn out the pages of the book. So she followed the trail of dust on the shelf. She managed to find the purple book just after putting it in her bag and taking it away. Wednesday was suddenly caught in a sack. Being kidnapped is definitely one of Wednesday. Others might be afraid of being kidnapped, but she felt fortunate because she, she's someone who dances like a zombie. 
a goth girl who loves blood and death, Wednesday, facing the people surrounding her. Wednesday could tell right away who they really were, classmates from the academy. She was disappointed and expecting an exciting killing game. She didn't expect a bunch of kids faced with the members of the Nightshade Society. Wednesday wondered what Rowan, the center of the mystery, had to do with this place. But Bianca said that Rowan had been kicked out last semester. Hearing that this place had nothing to do with the information she was looking for, before Bianca could even finish the sentence how only numbers could enter, Wednesday untied herself back in her dorm room. Wednesday stared at the prophetic illustration and wondered if she is the symbol of the college's demise. But why? During these end days, would there be a pilgrim? To find out, she decided to take the opportunity to volunteer for the school's outreach day and go to the pilgrims. The annual outreach day is designed to bring together the students of the academy and the residents of the town. But Wednesday's look was not so good. The place she drew to volunteer at was a quirky antique store. But no fear, she has a werewolf roommate. She just happened to select Pilgrim World, so Wednesday used the information that a handsome one was also in the antique store to successfully exchange tasks with Enid. The trouble is, in addition to the volunteer assignment, the principal was also interested in Wednesday's talent and asked her to play the cello at the bronze statue. Even though Wednesday hated the idea, she couldn't refuse. After that, everyone went to the town. Wednesday found her childhood friend, Horp, since he was a member of the Nightshade Society. Wednesday took out the purple book she had stolen and asked him who the pilgrim in this illustration was. Who would have thought? Thorpe actually knew. It turns out that the pilgrim was the founder of Jericho, the town, named Crackstone. After a brief introduction by the mayor, the town's volunteer activities were about to begin. Wednesday went to Pilgrim World. After changing into her work clothes, by asking the person in charge that day, she found out the location of the gallery of Crackstone. Today's volunteer task was to sell fudge to tourists in order not to attract attention and sneak away quietly. Wednesday scared away the tourists with hard-to-swallow truths. Then, she took a chubby boy with him to the Crackstone Exhibition Hall and successfully used his braces to open the lock on the door. Wednesday asked the chubby boy to stay outside and as a lookout, while Anthony slipped into the Exhibition Hall with the thing, Wednesday found a painting on the wall. It seemed to be a record of the punishment of a witch. The person being honored was none other than Crackstone. And the little girl in the painting was the girl Wednesday had seen during her vision at the rowing competition. Even the book she was holding was identical. In the display case not far away, the book in the girl's arms was exactly the same. Wednesday rushed to take it out, only to find that the inside was blank. It was a fake! The bad news is, the person in charge now grabbed the chubby boy and found Wednesday who looked like she had been caught red-handed. Through questioning, Wednesday learned that the real copy of the book was stolen two months ago. She wanted to know where the gathering and the painting was, so she went to the coffee shop and found Taylor. Wednesday unrolled the map, trying to find the original 17th century pilgrims meeting place. Tyler was a jack of all trades. He pointed to a forest on the map and gave Wednesday the location. Soon after, Wednesday followed the map into the dark and scary forest. The girl touched the wooden door and was instantly transported to the town. Not far away, she found a group of people holding torches, bullying a child who looked exactly like her. They were shouting to burn her, as if she had done something wrong. At that moment, the mayor of the town appeared before the girl, saying that she was a real-life devil, a witch who had to be burned alive. Wednesday hides at a distance and observes everything. The girl rebelled against the mayor, saying he had taken away her home and land. Then, she stabbed the mayor in the eye with a hidden dagger. The mayor was furious. He called everyone and tied the girl up in a wooden house. It turned out that there were many others in the house who had been driven out with the girl because they were all deviants. The pilgrims outside the house wanted to destroy them. Then, the mayor closed the door and the cabin was set on fire. The girl rushed to her mother, but she knew she could not escape. So she told the girl to escape through the tunnel. Wednesday followed the girl outside, only to see the mayor coming with a grim smile. He was about to take the girl back. She suddenly woke up from her vision and told Thane she knew who the girl was. Her name was Goody Adams. She should be her ancestor from 400 years ago. Wednesday then heard some rustling. She thought it was the homeless man who tried to drive her away before. She looked through the fence, but there was no one there. Just as she was about to look away, a large, bloodshot eye suddenly appeared. She was so scared that she backed up. That figure, it was the same monster that killed Rowan before. Wednesday seemed to have found a clue. She went out in pursuit of the creature. The sky was pouring with rain, and the road was covered with mud. She followed the footprints left by the monster, and found that the footprints were gradually taking the shape of human feet. It seemed that the creature was a shapeshifter. Coincidentally, that's when Thorpe showed up nearby. He claimed that he was worried about Wednesday, 
So he came to the forest to look for her. Wednesday told him that the monster was human. But Thorpe didn't believe her. So she prepared to show him the footprints. But the rain was too heavy. The footprints had been washed away. Thorpe left. Then he said he believed Wednesday's suspicions about Rowan. Because of Rowan's recent behavior, it was like he had become a different person. He could not remember many of his own memories. Then he guessed that Wednesday had the power of psychic visions. Wednesday said she discovered them a year ago, but who would expect that Thorpe would say he didn't believe in visions? Because they aren't, and they are difficult to control. Wednesday was half convinced. She told Thorpe that she saw Crackstone killing the. She told him that trying to, to prove that her visions might be able to help solve Rowan. Soon after, the statue dedication ceremony of the outreach day was about to begin. Wednesday stared at the bronze statue of Crackstone, heart full of contempt for this murderer. After the mayor called the ceremony to order, the band began to play music, and the water fountain around the statue started up. At that moment, Think quietly lit a match not far away. The flames quickly flared up. Everyone looked confused, thinking it was some kind of special welcome ceremony. Suddenly, a loud explosion sent everyone running for cover. Only Wednesday stayed in place. The scene became a her personal cello solo. From afar, the principal looked at everything, knowing the culprit, eyes aflame with rage. The bronze statue of Crackstone was melting due to the heat. The glorious face slowly drooped into a mud-like puddle. The Medusa boy was about to take a bath. But first, he had to do one thing, cover up the mirror. But in the process of washing his hair, the towel accidentally slipped. Without him realizing, the moment he pulled back the shower curtain, he was petrified by himself. Because of his petrification, he missed entirely the set time that he was supposed to go on his date with Enid. Finally, the werewolf girl lost it. She let out her sharp claws, not only scratching the car next to her, but puncturing his tires too. But just an hour ago, Enid was sharing her nervousness with her roommate Wednesday. It was her first date with her boyfriend, since of the explosion at the bronze statue ceremony in the morning. She still asked, what kind of freak would ruin such an important event? The words made Wednesday shiver, and she urged Enid to hurry up and go. After the explosion in the morning, the principal found Wednesday as soon as she could. Angry, she scolded Wednesday. Did she know how many citizens and parents have been reporting this crazy incident one after another? But Wednesday's face was innocent. She said the explosion was not his own doing. Let's review the scene of the crime. The real culprit was the one who dumped the oil drum. It was Thang. It had nothing to do with Wednesday. That even though the principal had no evidence, she already knew that everything is Wednesday's work. At that moment, Wednesday stood up. She told the principal she did it to expose the lie. She wanted the college to see the revered figure of Crackstone for the murderous sinner he was and wondered, as the principal of the Academy of Freaks, why would she agree to an outreach day like this, which just covered up the dark history? The principal said that this is a new opportunity. It's a new chapter for humans and freaks to get along again. The Wednesday knew she was just lying to herself. The principal's eyes revealed a sense of helplessness and anger. Before parting, she left a message. You know I don't get burned out easily. In the forest, the homeless man Wednesday met in the morning was fiddling with a camera he stole from an antique store. Suddenly, there was an unexplained noise. The sound of screaming and the hissing of a monster were mixed together. The camera on the side kept flashing. The killer's image had been captured. Soon, the police surrounded the scene. The death was gruesome. The sheriff took the camera back and enveloped the photos inside. The monster. There was finally a clue for the case. In the dormitory, Wednesday was writing through a series of recent events. She found the whole academy seemed to be hiding secrets. For example, the chubby boy who was investigating the case with her before was looking for something in the forest. The dorm manager and plant teacher, she also knew the secret code of the Nightshade Society. She walked towards the dark tunnel. She didn't. Medusa boy Ajax was petrified by his own power, while the principal crumpled up a photo of Wednesday's mother from her student days and threw it into the fire. There seems to be a deep connection between the two. Thorpe emerges from the mysterious wooden house in a panic. With a few cuts on his neck, is he the murderer who is going around? People say that monsters exist in Avermore Academy. But what they don't know is, there are monsters currently hiding among the normal people. Curious about who the killer is? Subscribe now and keep watching. In the morgue, a severed hand crept in by following the ventilation duct. He jumped onto the security camera and used gum to cover the lens. Then followed the wire to press the door button. At that moment a goth girl came in. Today, the girl and her hand are not here to play, but to do an autopsy for their investigation. Recently, there have been many murders committed by a mysterious monster. Last night, a homeless man was killed. The police also found the murderer on camera at the scene of the crime. A monster with a green face and fans. 
That's why Wednesday came to the morgue, because there's a first-hand account of the murder. Wednesday and the severed hand split up. The hand went to the photocopy room to find the files of the monster and make copies. Wednesday, on the other hand, stayed in the morgue and found the body of the homeless man. After carefully examining the wounds on the body, Wednesday found something strange. The victim's left foot was missing. It looked like it had been eaten by the monster. At that moment, the right hand that was making copies suddenly noticed movement outside the room. A turn of race, of course, as we done, so it hurried to the morgue, gesturing frantically to Wednesday, wanting her to hide. Just then, the sheriff, led by the coroner, also came into the morgue. The coroner confessed he had never seen such strange wounds on a corpse. And what's even stranger, on the left foot, two toes were cut off, presumably by the mutterer. The sheriff did not want the news to cause panic among the residents of the town. So he told the, the forensic scientist tell him as soon as there was news and prevented any information from getting out. Just as the coroner was about to leave, he noticed a door that had opened at some point without his knowledge. He pulled out the gurney to see. It was Wednesday, so he touched her cheek, stony and cold eggs. He was sure she was dead, but the forensic scientist, who wanted to slack off, decided to come back tomorrow to dissect the new body. So he left work quickly, then immediately popped out of the skull and opened the door for Wednesday. Five more minutes. It, of course, this death-loving girl has a weird brain. After collecting the evidence, Wednesday placed them one by one on the board and began to analyze the connections between the cases. She told her werewolf roommate, Enid, a very crucial point. The victims all had parts removed. But when she showed her findings to Enid, her roommate couldn't stand such disgusting imagery and fainted. Afterwards, in the plant class, her childhood friend Thorpe looked very uncomfortable. He claimed that he hurt his back while fencing, but the moment he turned his head, Wednesday, keen as ever, found that under the collar of his shirt, there were obvious scratch marks, so she thought that Thorpe was a serious suspect. After class ended, she followed him to a house in the woods. She saw Thorpe come out of the house as if he were a thief. Wednesday snuck in, after turning on the lights, she found that the house was full of monster-related drawings made by Thorpe. Every single one of them was a rendition of the same monster. So she thought there must be a connection between Thorpe and the creature. Because of his powers was that he could take his drawings and bring their subjects to life. So Wednesday picked up a painting as evidence and started to head back. But suddenly, she met Thorpe at the door. He asked her warily what she was doing here. Wednesday could only lie and that she was here to ask for help with her plant class. But he saw through her deception immediately because there was no homework today. So, in order to find a good excuse, Wednesday had to use the rave and ask Thorpe to be her date. He was happy to agree. Fortunately, while she was there with him, she could also get a closer look at this suspect. When she heard that Wednesday was going to the ball, Enid was so excited she wanted to take her dress shopping. But the colorful stores are a disaster for Wednesday. Just as she was about to leave, a gothic puffy dress in the antique store instantly attracted Wednesday's attention. What does a dark goth girl look like dancing? Have you seen it? She had a cool, aloof expression on her face. She put both arms up, crossing them back and forth, moving to the music, looking crazy, as if possessed by a zombie, a black dress that drew all the attention in a sea of white, seeing Wednesday and Tyler dancing closely with each other. Thorpe was jealous. He was the one who Wednesday had invited to dance with her. Why did it change later? It turns out that after Wednesday got the monster painting, she put the pictures related to the case in a beehive and looked for clues together with a chubby boy. The other party thought that the cave in the painting looked very familiar. So the two of them found the exact same place as was in the painting. Looking at the eerie cave, Wednesday was a little excited. Soon they arrived to its depths. The place was covered with white bones. It looked like the monster had been feeding here. Then, Wednesday found a broken claw on the wall. She believed it belonged to the monster. So, to test her suspicions, she went back to Thorpe's drawing room. She was going to find something with his DNA in it. And sure enough, she found a bloody t-shirt in the trash. But then, Thorpe showed up out of nowhere, and Wednesday was busted. She asked him if he himself was the monster. Why else would he make so many portraits of it? But Thorpe said he saw them all in his dreams. Because of his psychic powers, that's why the monster in the painting scratched his neck. Seeing his own portrait in Wednesday's hand, he suddenly understood why the other side had been in the house last time. She was just trying to collect evidence. She didn't really want to invite him to the party. Thorpe kicked Wednesday out in a fit of rage, and the party was ruined. In order to investigate the truth, Wednesday didn't want to tell the truth. She was a lone wolf anyway, so she went straight to the police. She handed the police the broken claw and the bloodstained cloaks, wanting them to run a DNA test so that they could find out if Thorpe was the monster after all. 
Although the sheriff didn't want the kid to get involved in the case, the evidence was there, so he investigated it anyway. Without her dance partner, Wednesday planning going to go with the chubby boy to go to the cave to track the monster's movements. But then, there was a knock at the door. They opened the door and saw it was Tyler. The other party was holding an invitation. Waiting, what's going on here? It turns out that during the day, Thing knew that Wednesday and Thorpe had a falling out, so he took it upon himself to send an invitation to Tyler at the coffee shop where he works. Additionally, while Wednesday was scrambling to find a dress for the dance, Thing had already brought back the goth gift she wanted. Good man, even Thing knows how aim Cupid. Look at his smug, proud look, it's so cute. In no time at all, Wednesday had turned into a proper debutante, appearing in front of Tyler. She took his breath away. The chubby boy was dumbfounded by this situation. They had agreed to go to the cave together. Why did you sneakily get a dance partner? The chubby boy decided to explore on his own. Wednesday warned him not to go by himself, but he didn't listen to the advice and went to the dark forest alone. At the school dance, Wednesday's moves attracted everyone's attention and successfully ignited the whole atmosphere. Everyone was being carried away by the joy and excitement of it all. At that moment, a big car pulled up outside the door. Several pilgrims from before appeared, connecting the hose in the hallway towards the dance. The atmosphere had reached its peak, as everyone was dancing in ecstasy. The pilgrim in the corner flipped a switch on the sprinkler, and red liquid poured down from the sky, dyeing everyone's white costumes bright red. The scene was chaotic. Wednesday tasted the liquid. It was paint! At that moment, someone accidentally bumped into Wednesday. In the vision, the chubby boy was frantically running from something. In imminent danger, Wednesday ran out to find him without a second thought. Meanwhile, in the forest, the chubby boy found a suspicious man blowing up the mysterious cave. The man seemed to have noticed him, so he fled in a panic, but the monster in the cave was disturbed and ran out, quickly finding the chubby boy. By the time Wednesday arrived, the chubby boy was already covered with wounds. He was dying. This academy is full of freaks. There were vampires, werewolves, sirens, and faceless witches. But this A school, a murder had shaken things up. The monster that killed so many people has not yet been found. And Wednesday, this is hard for Wednesday to accept. And this murder case went cold a long time ago. It was 1990. The Evermore Academy was heading its annual rave. The principal, who was a student at the time, was walking outside with an umbrella. Suddenly, a boy fell in front of her, causing panic and screams. The principal looked up. Gomez Adams was there above her, holding a long sword and covered in blood, looking like a vicious murderer. The police soon arrived at the scene. The principal as a witness gave her account to Walker, who was the sheriff even then, saying the real killer was Adams and trying to claim the Wednesday's mother, Morticia, caused the incident. In the end, Adams was charged with murder and taken away. But this story, which had been sealed for 32 years, has finally been uncovered again today. Its parents weakened in Avermore Academy. Back at their alma mater, the Adams, unbeknownst to them, a distant Wednesday was watching everything through binoculars. The principal welcomed everyone warmly. She expressed her regret about the chubby boy and said he was recovering. Wednesday knew that the chubby boy was in a coma. Hearing the principal's words, she was obviously a little unhappy and blamed herself everything. The family finally met. Hearing what happened to their daughter all this time, from being nearly killed, to abducted, to haunted by evil spirits, the couple smiled with satisfaction. But the principal had always seen Wednesday's mother, Morticia, as a thorn in her side. Seeing her former rival, she couldn't resist trying to cause trouble. She said Wednesday did, but the Adams. Instead, her mother was reliving her old days and borrowed a yearbook from back in the day. Then, the family went to see the psychiatrist with Wednesday. But unexpectedly, Wednesday suddenly produced a file. She was upset that her parents were hiding something from her. She asks her father why he killed this man named Garrett. Her mother was furious, insisting that Wednesday. She was displeased with Wednesday's behavior. So they all parted ways. Wednesday decided to find out the truth for herself. In the town, the sheriff saw Adam step out of the car with a face full of hatred. He wondered why such a murderer could walk down the street with open arms. Then he got the call. It turned out that the medical examiner had shot himself. According to the suicide note he left behind, he had falsified an autopsy report in a case years ago. He was so ashamed that he killed himself. And the case, it was the same case where Adams killed Garrett. What a coincidence. The sheriff thinks it must have been a faulty autopsy report. That's why Adams got out of jail. Now he had to bring him to justice. So he immediately went to Nivelmore College. In front of everyone, he arrested Adams for the murder of Garrett. Wednesday watched as her father was taken away. What will she do to rescue him? How does marriage change a person's face? The handsome man in front of me, 
after 20 years of marriage, has rounded out somewhat, not only has his waist expanded somewhat, his height has begun to shrink too. He is the famous representative of the Adams family, Gomez Adams. He is also Wednesday's cute dad, but the seemingly goofy Gomez turned out to be a suspected murderer. And as school parent day approached, the long lost murder case was reopened. Wednesday watched as her father was taken away by the sheriff, helpless to do anything about it. The next day, Wednesday went to the jail with him to visit him, looking at her father clad in bright orange. Wednesday's eyes watered due to her color allergy. Thing expressed his longing and sadness through the barrier, and pressured by his daughter. Gomez had to explain the murder case from his youth. It turns out that the murdered Garrett, he was obsessed with the beauty of Wednesday's mother, Morticia, stalking her like a maniac. Morticia decided to call the police because she was afraid. But because of the Garrett family's legacy and importance, no one dared to offend them. Naturally, no one believed Morticia's words. Later, at a dance party at the college, Garrett found out that Gomez and Morticia were lovers. Out of his mind, he grabbed a longsword and attacked Gomez. The two of them fought for a while, and it was obvious that Gomez was losing. In order to protect himself, he grabbed a longsword. As the scene descended into chaos, Garrett tried to attack again, but he ran straight onto the longsword and fell from the top of the building. At that moment, Principal Larissa, who was passing by, spotted them. She looked up and saw Gomez standing on the second floor with a longsword in his hand. So she thought he was a killer. Although her father's story seemed to be perfect and logical. As a daughter, Wednesday saw her father's unconscious movements. She knew two things. He seemed to be hiding something and that he was definitely not the murderer because she knew he didn't have the guts to do it. So Wednesday went to the sheriff to tell him that her father wasn't a murderer. Because the events of the past few days were too coincidental, someone must be behind it. The purpose was to halt their investigation of the monster. At that moment, the sheriff said, after testing the item she gave him last time, they found that the DNA didn't match, which means Thorpe was not the monster. Further, someone used black gum to cover the surveillance camera in the autopsy room, prevented the police from knowing what actually happened the day the coroner committed suicide. The sheriff advised Wednesday not to beg for mercy for her father, because the victim's family had also been torn apart after the case. The mother hung herself, the father died of alcoholism, and the sister, the only relative left, died in a shipwreck. The sheriff believes that Gomez, the murderer, should pay for their suffering. After returning, Wednesday found her mother praying at the mysterious Nightshade Society. Seeing the arrival of her daughter, Morticia was surprised and also realized that her daughter had come for nothing. When Wednesday spoke up, Morticia finally revealed the truth about the murder case 32 years ago. The night of the murder, Morta sought her lover, Gomez, being beaten up without a fight, so she picked up the long sword on the ground. Garrett was like a raging beast, foaming at the mouth, and he crashed into the sword. Garrett's real murderer was Morticia, but Gomez wanted to save his lover from being accused of murder, so he grabbed the sword and took all the blame for her. Hearing this, Wednesday noticed a detail. Her mother said Garrett was foaming at the mouth, and extremely manic, which sounded a lot like a reaction to poisoning. Could this be the cause of the incident? To find out, mother and daughter went to the cemetery. Wednesday's favorite thing since she was a child was digging up other people's graves. She picked up a shovel and hacked away at the dirt. As full of excitement, her mother encouraged her from time to time. And finally, the shovel hit something hard. Wednesday brushed away the dust on it and revealed the golden nameplate. And so, the lid of Garrett's final resting place was lifted by Wednesday. Looking at the dead man's refined and delicate skin, with its faint blue glow, Wednesday laughed out loud. She already knew that her deduction that it was poison was correct. But unfortunately, a policewoman on patrol was passing by. She found the mother and daughter who were so openly grave robbing. And so, the Adams family was reunited in prison. Tired of looking at her crooked parents, Wednesday felt nothing but disdain and decided to escape quickly. When she left the grave, she was smart enough to secretly break off one of Garrett's fingers. The soft tissue of the dried finger was intact and glowed blue. It was clear that it had been poisoned by a poison called lobelia. In other words, before Garrett was stabbed to death, he was already doomed because of the poison, so that her parents could probably be eliminated as suspects. When Wednesday held the finger, she once again had strong visions. She saw Garrett's father give a bottle of blue potion to his son, and in the subsequent fight with Gomez, Garrett accidentally ran into a wall. The bottle shattered, letting the potion seep through his skin and into his body, poisoning him. When she woke up, Wednesday rushed to tell her parents. Garrett didn't just try to kill his father, he also wanted to use the potion to poison the everyone at Navarmore Academy to get rid of the outcasts. So the next day, Wednesday and her mother went to Sheriff Walls, who was in charge of the case back then. Now, he was the mayor of the town. 
Apparently, the mayor knew the real reason for Garrett's death from the beginning, but because of the powerful background and influence of Garrett's father, and in order to protect the town's reputation and safety, the truth was suppressed. Otherwise, the reputation of the town and the college would have been ruined. Morticia saw through the mayor's lies at a glance. She still remembered when Garrett bragged to her that his father had bribed the sheriff. And a year later, Sheriff Wall was elected mayor. Apparently, he suppressed the case to save his own reputation. At first, the mayor tried to argue with her. But after Morticia pointed out that, back then, if the mayor had just accepted and believed her own police report, Garrett might not have died. Sheriff Wall didn't even do his job. And yet he was elected mayor of the town. If word of this gets out, his career would be ruined. So the mayor chose to compromise. He promised Morticia that he would drop all murder charges against Gomez and release him immediately with a full and unequivocal apology from the sheriff's office. Gomez was soon released. The sheriff, who had previously held a grudge against him, finally overcame his grudge, shaking hands and making peace with Gomez. It was the first time that Wednesday and her mother had accomplished something so big together. After saving her father from an unjust fate, the relationship between the two of them grew stronger. There was an indescribable connection. Morticia asked her daughter how long ago she started seeing visions and expressed that she was worried for her. Wednesday answered truthfully. Morticia told her if she wanted to control her psychic ability, she would have to turn to the ancestor who appeared in her vision. Wednesday's ancestor, Goody, was a powerful witch but also full of hatred. How can Wednesday control her psychic powers? After saying goodbye to her family, Wednesday's mother gifted her her old yearbook, and Wednesday discovered the principal was a shapeshifter. Immediately, she realized something. Wednesday knew that the seemingly resurrected Rowan was actually the shapeshifted principal. So she asked her why she did it, but the principal said that Rowan's father already knew about his death and asked her to take care of it because he wanted the police to stay out of it. Because Rowan had lost control of himself several times, he had almost killed Wednesday. That incident would bring shame to their family and it would also affect the reputation of the college. And so, just by pretending to be Rowan, to bad things could been avoided. It seems that the principal, like the mayor, only cares about reputations. Suddenly, there was an unexplained noise outside the window. The phrase fire ring was burned onto the school lawn, seemingly threatening them. The girl set up a battle squad in the dormitory. She wanted to do a scenes to summon her ancestors and learn how to control her psychic abilities from them. Her mouth chanted the words, the pendulum swung back and forth, and the dormitory door slowly opened. A gust of wind blew out all the candles. Could it be that the ancestor is about to appear? From the door, a pink girl bounced in. So it was Enid, her cute werewolf from it all along. It seemed that Wednesday's summoning failed, but a slip of paper was slid through the crack in the door. On it was a collage of letters spelling. For answers, meet me at the Crackstone's crypt at midnight. Wednesday thought it was a clue from her ancestors, so she went gladly set out for the crypt. Enid wanted to accompany Wednesday, but because she was too scared, she decided to wait outside. Wednesday went inside, the dark crypt felt eerie and haunted. There were random, unexplainable noises. Wednesday warned the other side to reveal their true form. Who would have thought? It was some academy students who suddenly appeared. Enid also brought a cake from the back. It was Wednesday's birthday. Looking at the students who were singing the birthday song, Wednesday felt no joy at all because for her, her birthday was more like hell. When she was a child, every birthday, her parents gave her gifts that were simply confusing to Wednesday. It was either a coffin or a giant guillotine cake. Even the toys for party games were just endless big spiders. All this taught Wednesday to hate birthdays. So she ignored everyone's expectant eyes, focusing on a string of Latin words on the wall. Fire will rain, exactly like the one that burned on the lawn yesterday. Wednesday thought it couldn't be a coincidence. So she put her hand on it, and in an instant, she had a vision again. Ancestor Goody kept reminding her Crackstone was coming. Wednesday asked for help in controlling her psychic abilities. But Goody simply said the raging river was uncontrollable. Wednesday could only rely on herself, and Goody knew they didn't have much time left to stop Crackstone. She told Wednesday she had to find the place in the vision as soon as possible. According to memory, Wednesday drew that iron case because thing reveals the privacy of her birthday. So she was very cold to it. At that moment, Ina came forward and says that it is all her idea and handed Wednesday a gift. It turns out to be a soft black scarf and it is a couple with hers. I think we should wear it for special occasions, like funerals. In search of Iron Gate, Wednesday come to the coffee shop to ask Taylor but can't get an answer. She has no choice but to find Thorpe, hoping it can help her. Miraculously, in Thorpe's studio, there is an identical painting. This is what Thorpe sees in her nightmare the other day. What kind of place is this? 
Next episode preview, Wednesday receives a confession from Thor, but runs away in a panic in order to find the Iron Gate and the truth behind it. Enid is ignored by Wednesday. She leaves the dorm in a feat of rage. Friendship fractures. Look at this painting in front of you. The little girl in it is being controlled by her special power. Suddenly, she started playing her violin. The melodious violin music floats out from the painting. It's simply exquisite. And the subject of the that girl was standing in right in front of it. The girl guessed the boy's intention in making this. But she had been single for 16 years. She didn't know what to do. So she suddenly ran straight out of the room. Leaving the boy in shock and disbelief. Wednesday knew she was destined to be alone for the rest of her life. So she didn't want to have any emotional attachments. Now all she had to do was to find the mysterious place that her ancestor had told her about. With Thorpe's help, she learned the painting was of the Garrett family's old house. So the next day, she went to the abandoned house all by herself. Just as she was about to enter the house, Wednesday suddenly heard a commotion from inside. So she rushed to find a place to hide. Then, the mayor of the town came out of the house. Wednesday spied on him from afar. She heard him talking to someone on the phone. The conversation seemed to be about a closely kept secret. So Wednesday asked them to distract the mayor as she took advantage of the situation to get into the trunk of the mayor's car. Shortly thereafter, the mayor drove back to town. He said hello to the sheriff at the coffee shop. But just as it was crossing the street, a car suddenly appeared and knocked the mayor to the ground. Then, it sped away. Wednesday saw what happened. She became the second eyewitness next to the sheriff. Fortunately, the mayor was not killed, but the situation was still quite bad. After Wednesday's statement was taken, the sheriff sent her back to school. The principal was furious. She couldn't understand why Wednesday was always at the center of all of this mess, why all the recent incidents had to do with her. The principal decided to put the whole school on lockdown and ban Wednesday from leaving the school. But Wednesday still had her ancestors' advice on her mind. She felt that there must be some secret in the old house. Although she was grounded, Wednesday called Tyler, asking him to pick her up at 8 p.m. In front of the school, naive, Tyler thought she was inviting him on a date, so he readily agreed. Then Wednesday found her werewolf roommate again. She used the excuse that she wanted to try celebrating her birthday with her again to invite her to go out. The werewolf, Enid, looked at the moon and the sky, and suddenly, she realized werewolves had the privilege to leave the school when they transformed. So she got a pass to the forest and the two of them successfully escaped from the school. Meanwhile, Taylor arrived as planned. Seeing Wednesday, he was about to greet her. But there was another person in the back seat. I thought we were going on a date. I thought it was girls night. Wednesday's trick managed to fool two people into going with her. And so, the two fools followed Wednesday to the old house. Where Wednesday skillfully unlocked the door and advised them that if they wanted to leave, she wouldn't stop them, but they were already here. They had no choice but to follow Wednesday into the courtyard. Enid used her strength genes and managed to pry the door open, and they went to the garage of the old house. There was a blue Cadillac parked inside. It was obvious that it was the same car that ran down the mayor. At this point, Enid had a bad feeling about everything. She tried to call the police, but she was stopped by Wednesday because if the sheriff knew that she broke the school rules and went out, and if he told the principal, then Wednesday would be expelled from the academy. After a tour of the first floor, Wednesday found a switch in the bookcase. After flicking it, a huge portrait of Crackstone appeared from behind the bookshelf. With candles in front of it, it was obvious that someone was worshipping him here. After feeling the warmth of the candle wick, Wednesday was sure that the worshipper had just left. So she asked Tyler to stay and check the first floor while she and Wolfie went to the second floor. Wednesday found a bedroom on the second floor. Not only was the bed neat and clean, there was also a fresh bouquet of flowers on the bed by a music box initials card into it. Wednesday recognized it as Garrett's sister's belongings, but she died 32 years ago. So who put it there? As soon as the words were out of her mouth, she heard Tyler screams from the first floor. The monster's shadow was cast onto the wall. It was coming to the second floor. The girls were exploring the old house, but instead, they found a horrible monster that eats people. Seeing the monster approaching, the girls hid in the elevator, but by now, the monster had already found them. Wednesday immediately closed the iron door, waiting in to see what would happen. Suddenly, the monster roared and pounded on the door of the compartment. In desperation, Wednesday tied the door shut with the scarf Enid had given her. But the monster's sharp claws cut through the iron door like butter. Its terrible eyes stared at the two of them, but it didn't make another move. It turns out it was just waiting for the elevator cable to break. Wednesday and Enid fell down the elevator shaft. 
Tumbling all the way to the basement, Wednesday turned on the light and found that everything in front of her was even creepier than before. It turned out that it was full body parts from the victims killed by the monster. It seems that the person in this old house was the one behind all the cases after all. By then, the monster had already reached the basement. Wednesday rushed to escape through the window. The monster almost caught her, but failed. The two of them immediately ran toward the woods, but Wednesday doubled back the way she came because Tyler was still in the old house. Sure enough, Taylor was seriously injured, with four deep scratches on his chest. Strangely enough, Thorpe also appeared at this time, so the four men went to Tyler's house to treat his wounds, just as Enid was worried that they might be discovered by the academy. The sheriff pushed open the door. What the fuck? What's going on here? Just in time. Wednesday told the sheriff what she had just seen and heard, telling him that the murderer was in the old house. So they went back there together. But the strange thing is, the car that had been in the garage just a moment ago, the victim's body parts in the basement, everything had disappeared. Looking at the empty house, the sheriff thought he had been tricked by Wednesday, so he sent her back to the school in anger. The principal had been waiting for her for a long time. In response to Wednesday's blatant violation of the rules, she decided to expel her. At that moment, Wednesday took the prophetic illustration out of her pocket and explained why she had broken the rules. It turns out that Rowan's mother left this picture before she died. She believed that Wednesday is destined to destroy the school, but the principal was determined to protect the school, so she decided not to expel Wednesday, instead placing her under constant supervision to protect Nerfmore. Back in the dormitory, Wednesday found Enid packing her bags. She seemed to be preparing to leave. It turned out that she was leaving because Wednesday, in pursuit of her goal, used the friendship between them and put her friend in danger without a second thought or caring at all. This made Enid very angry, and she couldn't come to terms with it. She had been trying very hard to become Wednesday's friend. So even if Wednesday didn't ask her to do it, she felt that this was how friends should be. Now it seemed to Enid that Wednesday didn't see it that way. So the little wolf girl got angry and moved to another dormitory, looking at the empty room. For the first time, Wednesday felt what loneliness was. She could understand why her ancestors said she would be alone. However, when she took out the music box she had taken from the old house, a pile of photos fell out of a secret compartment beneath it. He recorded all of Wednesday's movements from the time she started school until now. It seems that the murderer had been lurking on the campus, watching her every move. Elsewhere, a mysterious person had infiltrated the mayor's hospital room, secretly removing his oxygen tube. Wednesday pulled out the rapier hidden in her umbrella and stabbed a suspicious person that appeared behind her, but she was knocked down by the electric current coming from her opponent's hand. After seeing the figure's face, oh, the girl smiled. The man was her Uncle Fester. After hearing about what happened on Wednesday, Uncle Fester, who was wanted by the police, risked being arrested so he could come visit and help his little niece. Ten minutes ago, the funeral of the mayor was held. After being involved in a car accident, he tragically passed away. The clues to the case were scattered and unclear. Wednesday looked at everyone at the funeral, knowing that the murderer must be hiding among them. That's when she spotted the suspicious figure of her uncle. That's when she stabbed him. She knew that her uncle had come to help her solve the case, so she took him to the chubby boy's beehive and took out the picture of the monster. The uncle immediately recognized it as a monster called Hyde and also told her about how during his previous day in the mental hospital, he saw an example of someone, oh, after being stimulated by electrotherapy suddenly transformed. At this point, Wednesday's uncle mentioned that there was a diary in which the details of the monster were recorded, stored in the library of the Nightshade Society. Hearing this, Wednesday decided to sneak into the club that night. While waiting for the night to fall, Wednesday wrote in her room. At that moment, Enid came to the dormitory to look for her nail polish. This was the third time in an hour that she had come back to get something. Even a rock could tell that she wanted to make up with Wednesday. But who would have thought? Wednesday was dumber than a rock. Not only did she not notice, she also had a big fight with Enid. In the end, the two of them parted ways unhappily. In that evening, Wednesday came to the Nightshade Club. She saw Thorpe there. When he heard that he was looking for a diary related to monsters, Thorpe said that there was no such thing there. He sounded irritated and anxious because he was always suspected of being a monster, even though he had been firmly on Wednesday's side from the beginning. Of course, Wednesday's suspicions were not unfounded. Before and after each monster appearance, Thorpe always showed up, and the portrait of the monster in the drawing room is good cause for suspicion. Thorpe retorted, asking if he was the monster. Why didn't he hurt Wednesday? Instead, he saved her life. To refute him, Wednesday put it down to the fact that Thorpe liked her. Hearing this, Thorpe stormed off. When no one was around, 
Uncle Faster quietly appeared. When Thin saw him, it acted like it had lost its mind. So it was the uncle who turned him into this. The two of them fought, man versus hand. Only after Wednesday's scolding did the fight finally stop. After that, Uncle opened a mysterious mural, reveals the safe inside. Thin shows off his skills. It doesn't take long for him to unlock the complicates lock. Wednesday manages to get the diary about Hyde. By looking through the diary, she learns that Hyde was the offspring of an alien species that remained dormant and only woke up after a traumatic event, either by using chemicals or hypnosis to induce the other to transform. And during this process, Hai will establish contact with the person who liberates their state and follow the orders of the other party. It seems that now they not only have to find out who the monster is, we also had to find out who was behind it. So Wednesday, together with her uncle, planned to follow the suspect, Horp. Wednesday first found Sopo talking to the mystery man. Then, when he wasn't looking, Uncle placed a tracker on Thorpe's body that to follow the target, the spotted dog car car, driving in the direction of Thorpe. Then, in the woods, Wednesday found out that the mysterious man Thorpe went to see was her psychiatrist. Could it be the one behind this? Wednesday returned to her room just to find that her pet's severed hand was firmly pinned to the wall with a dagger. Not only that, the room was also in a mess and the important monster diary had been stolen. Looking at Thane bleeding profusely, Wednesday's heart caught in her throat. She quickly wrapped a towel around him, running to her nearby uncle Faster for help. Hearing of the emergency, Faster immediately asked Wednesday to clear the table and prepare to administer first aid. He rubbed his hands together, releasing an electric current as it started to try to shock Thane back to life. Once, twice, but Thane didn't. For the first time, Wednesday shed tears for someone else. She cried and threatened him. If you die, I'll kill you, then asked her uncle to continue the resuscitation. Finally, with their persistent efforts, Thing gradually woke up. Wednesday rushed to ask who did it, but the murderer attacked from behind. And Thing didn't, so Wednesday Pinky promised with it, vowing to make the killer pay a terrible price. Just before this nasty incident happened, Wednesday was invited to the crypt by Tyler for a romantic cemetery date. And before she left, she asked Thing to protect the diary that described Hyde's monster. But just after the romantic date ended, Thing was attacked. Wednesday immediately reported the incident to the principal, saying the diary of the Academy's founder had been stolen and that the monster that was killing people was the legendary Hyde. But the principal was not surprised to hear this. On the contrary, she knew a lot about the monster Hyde. It turned out that she had known all along, but because Hyde is a forbidden monster, if others knew about it, the Academy, so the principal decided to keep the matter hidden forever. That means that Wednesday could not find the current murderer here, so she tried again. Having heard the commotion, her classmate Bianca brought Wednesday to see the mayor's son. He said he had a lead on the killer for her. He turned out the son was going through the files on his father's desk and discovered that it was connected to an incident with the Garrett family years ago. It seems the mayor has been tracking Garrett's sister Laurel. Apparently, despite what they heard before, she had because Wednesday's parents killed Garrett. His sister, Laurel, wanted revenge. That's why she orchestrated these murders involving all of Navarmore Academy. Now, the logic of the case was clear. Wednesday was convinced that this legendary Laurel was her very own psychologist. She immediately went to the clinic. First, she returned the music box she had taken to her psychologist. Then, despite the psychologist, she shared her suspicions. The psychiatrist had left a bouquet of flowers in for the chubby boy in his hospital room. It was exactly the same as the one she saw in the bedroom of the old house, proving her identity. Then she used her position to unlock the seal on Thorpe's body through hypnosis and manipulate him in order to achieve her revenge plan. In the face of Wednesday's deductions, the doctor was confused and felt that she had been wrongly accused. After advising Wednesday to see a psychiatrist, she threw her out and then called the principal to explain the incident. No sooner than had she finished speaking, there was an unusual sound from the bathroom. The doctor opened the door and saw the monster appeared without warning. By the time the principal and Wednesday learned the news, the psychologist had died of serious injuries. Wednesday thought the person behind the case died, so everything would naturally come to an end. As such, that night, she waited in the drawing room for Thorpe to arrive. After returning to him the dagger that had stabbed Thing, and despite Thorpe's attempts to explain, she ripped down a nearby canvas. There was picture of the psychologist torn to shred by claw marks. And that's not all. Wednesday also found items from the victims in Thorpe's drawing room. Rowan's inhaler, that chubby boy, even the psychologist. Finally, she had all the evidence. Thorpe was the monster. Thorpe cried out that he was innocent, but it was too late. The police rushed in and arrested him. But is it really that simple? Wednesday had just kissed her first love. 
only to collapse and convulse. Suddenly, she saw in a vision that her first love was the murderer she had been looking for. The monster hide. Wednesday opened her eyes slowly. The moment she saw Tyler, a chill ran down her back. Everything that had happened before suddenly became clear. When Rowan had tried to kill Wednesday, Tyler was the only one present. That's why he turned into a monster and saved her. When she went to the ruins, Taylor was the only one who knew where Wednesday was going. So the monster once again appeared just in time. And on the day of the dance, Tyler was the only one who heard Wednesday and the chubby boy. He knew that they had found the cave. Only then did he ask the psychologist to blow up and seriously injure the chubby boy. The most admirable thing was Taylor's acting skills in the old Garrett house. In order not to reveal his identity, he even scratched himself, pretending to be attacked by a monster and gaining everyone's trust. So Wednesday set up another date with Tyler, but this time, she was there to reveal his identity. Despite Wednesday's reasoning and evidence, Tyler just wouldn't admit he was a monster and had put on a very good show. Just as he was about to slip away, members of the Nightshade Society appeared and stopped him. Bianca used the science song to confuse him and tied him up in Forbes' art room. When Tyler awoke, Wednesday took out a picture of her mother's fencing club members and pointed out that the member on the far left, Tyler, it turns out that the handsome boy was the offspring of an alien and a human. According to the information Wednesday found out, Tyler ultimately becoming a hide under the immense burden, and Tyler's father has been suffering in silence, worried that his son would inherit the monster gene. That said, Wednesday took out a series of tools, ready to hurt Tyler if that, to force him to reveal his true form. As she did so, raising her stun gun and pointing it at Tyler. But when everyone in the Nightshade Society saw this scene, they couldn't bear Wednesday's cruelty and they all left. Back at the academy, they immediately reported the incident to the principal and the principal called the sheriff to rescue Tyler. Just as Wednesday raised the hammer and was about to drop it, the sheriff arrived just in time to save his son. Wednesday was then arrested and taken to the police station. The sheriff and Tyler didn't, but she was still convinced he was the monster Hyde. That's when Tyler came up to her, wanting to talk to her alone, with teary eyes. He said, what was that like? What does it feel? What it's like to lose? Tyler finally showed his true colors, seeing how arrogant he was. Wednesday could only clench her teeth, swallowing all her anger and turning it into motivation. Back at school, Wednesday was expelled by the principal. She told the principal the truth, but she was blamed for not talking to her in advance and acting alone. When things didn't change, Wednesday had to go to the prison and ask Thorpe for help, but he was in chains. The moment he saw Wednesday, Thorpe exploded. He blamed Wednesday for ruining his life, saying that she was the cause of all this misery, and he sent her away. In the end, Wednesday had to pack her things and leave. Ina came as soon as she heard the news. Now that they were friends, she couldn't let go of Wednesday. Wednesday reminded her to be careful with Tyler, and Ina promised her that she would. She decided to take care of everyone at the academy. She also brought good news that the chubby boy had finally woken up after his attack. Before she left, Wednesday went to the hospital to see the chubby boy. He woke up and told what he saw before the attack that day. He vaguely remembered the man who blew up the cave was wearing a pair of red boots. And in the academy, there was only one person who wore red boots, the herbology teacher. That teacher, in order to avenge her loved ones, approached and bewitched an outsider student. Not only did he chain him in a cave and torture him, she also used drugs to control him in order to free the student's nature to turn him into a high monster that would be at her beck and call. She even disguised herself as a serious and responsible teacher and fooled everyone after realizing the teacher's secret through the chubby boy. Wednesday went to find her as soon as possible and revealed her identity together with Tyler. There was no longer any need OT pretend. The teacher took off her glasses and ordered Tyler to kill Wednesday. Then she walked up to Tyler, but she didn't expect him to transform, taking on the appearance of the principal. So this was Wednesday's and the principal's plan, seeing the real killer right in front of her. The principal advised Miss Marilyn to stop, but the other party suddenly pulled out a tube of poison from her pocket, shouting, My name is Laurel, and stabbing the principal in the neck. So soon after the confrontation began, the principal had already been defeated. Wednesday also failed to escape, knocked out by the teacher with a shovel. Fortunately, she had, and it rushed out to find help. When Wednesday woke up, she found herself hanging in the crypt of Crackstone. Laurel was organizing the remains of the dead that Tyler had collected for a ritual. She took out the stolen Book of Shadows, getting ready to perform a spell. She wanted to resurrect her ancestor, Crackstone, and help him to work together clear the town of all the outsiders. But the last step of the spell was still missing. It was also the most critical step. That is the blood from a descendant of Goody Adams. 400 years ago, 
Goody killed Crackstone and sealed him in this crypt. And only Wednesday's blood under the full moon could break the seal? This is also the reason Laurel created such an elaborate plot. From the moment Wednesday entered the school, revenge had already begun. You are the secret key. Wednesday finally understood the true meaning of her ancestors' words. Laurel then slashed Wednesday's palm with a knife and pressed it against the seal, reciting the incantation aloud. The spell was slowly activated. Lightning flashed outside the window. A thick black smoke came out of the coffin, and when the black smoke cleared, Crackstone had been resurrected before their very eyes. Wednesday undid her chains, getting ready to stop him, but she was blocked by Crackstone. He took out a dagger and stabbed Wednesday in the abdomen. Then, he went to attack the academy. Wednesday collapsed to the ground. She was dying. That's when Ancestor Goody finally appeared. She told Wednesday, only by piercing the black heart of Crackstone would it finally disappear forever, and only Wednesday could end it all. Goody said, the necklace around Wednesday's neck is a powerful amulet, not only can it summon visions but also summon spirits. So Goody sacrifices himself. Wednesday was used by the necklace, recovering her strength. She immediately ran towards the direction of the college. Unexpectedly, she ran into Taylor halfway. Tyler knows he had exposed. He grabs Wednesday quickly transforms into Hyde. He wants to kill her. A wolf suddenly appears. Taylor knocks him to the ground. Looking at the little pink hair on his head, Wednesday understood. That was her roommate. She managed to complete her transformation on the full moon. Wednesday received a look from her and quickly ran towards the college. At that moment, MB and the Nightshade, after receiving the call for help from Thane, immediately evacuates the students. And the sheriff hears the commotion, also took Sopo together. He drives towards the woods. The sheriff leaves Sopo in the car. At that moment, Thane appears and unlocks the chains on his body. In the academy, Crestone is attacking indiscriminately. The school building was a mess. Wednesday arrives just in time. This shocked Crestone. The two are about to go at it. Thorpe suddenly appears. He fires his bow and arrow to kill Crestone, but he was controlled by powerful magic. When the arrow rebounds, Wednesday deflects the damage with her body for Thorpe. Wednesday orders Thorpe to protect the classmates. She pulled out the arrow, uses her longsword to fight, but the magic wand is too powerful. The sword is broken. Wednesday is about to die. At that moment, a sword pierces through the chest of Cresto. It is Ambi. Unfortunately, it didn't hit the heart. Wednesday immediately takes over. She thrusts the dagger into his heart. With a owl, Cresto is successfully eliminated. And it go up in smoke, but it isn't over yet. Laurel appears with a gun in her hand. She vowed to take Wednesday away today. And just as she is about to pull the trigger, a swarm of bees appears and surrounds her. It turns out that Fatty had used her powers to save Wednesday. Remembering the promise she makes with Thay, Wednesday did not hesitate, kicks up. In the woods, the sheriff finds his son, who has turned into a monster. With his help to stop it, Tyler and the wolf girl's battle ended. Tyler was seriously injured and unconscious, and Wolfie dragged her bloody body, appeared in front of everyone. The first person cares about her is Wednesday, seeing the other party appearing safe and sound in front of her her eyes. She couldn't resist hugging her. This time, Wednesday finally does not refuse the hug. Nivellmore College is reborn. Wednesday's novel and the curtain came down. The thrilling journey was coming to an end. Vacation begins. Before she leaves, Wednesday received a call from Thor. She thinks it's time for a change. But just now, the phone receives a strange text message. It is a picture of someone taking pictures of her. Maybe another stalker has appeared. Maybe the story of Wednesday isn't over yet. Some secrets are still lurking in the dark corners. Who knows? Maybe Laurel and Taylor are also pawns in someone else's elaborate plan. Thank you to everyone watch it. This is the end of season 1 Wednesday. Let's look forward to the next season.